On modern mountain bikes, air suspension is pretty much the king. It's really versatile, you can do a lot with it, and of course, it's very easy to use. However, we're starting to see coil suspension being used more and more by certain enduro racers. So this made me think, I've got a bike here with Fox suspension on. We've come to Fox UK, and I'm gonna have a go at seeing if we can get some coil suspension on this bike, if it makes a good difference or not, even if it's something that you guys should be considering at home. Let's go and check it out. Coil shocks and air shocks are both gonna have some different advantages of their own, but you're always gonna see an air shock on bikes in your bike shop, shop floor, quite simply because of the fact that they're almost infinitely adjustable to different rider weights. You don't need to start specking different springs and things on them, and they're very easily tunable. For this reason, the air shock pretty much is king in mountain biking. And this adjustability is actually key for me. I'm a huge fan of air shocks. Sometimes I might ride with a bag that weighs up to 20 pounds. And of course, I'm gonna to have to put some more air pressure in the shock to compensate for that. If I had a coil shock on my bike, I'd have to be changing the physical spring, which goes on the outside of the shock. That means having different springs for different weights that I'm gonna go riding with. However, I'm well aware that there are certain performance enhancements to be had from running a coil shock, namely some of the grip, the traction, and that bespoke feel that you get from running a coil shock. So we're gonna have a look at them in a bit more detail. Okay, first things first, let's take a look at some of the differences from a coil shock to an air shock. Now, the obvious one you're gonna notice with a coil shock is it uses a coil spring. The coil spring sits on the outside of the shock. With the air shock, your air spring is on the inside of the shock, so it's incorporated into the shock body. One of the things this is obviously gonna mean is on a coil shock, depending on your rider weight, how much you weigh in your riding kit with your bags and things, you're gonna to need to change the spring. The springs come in different weight increments. Uh, I think it's 25 pound increments, so you're gonna to need to get the right setup that suits you on your bike. Whereas with an air shock, you've just got a Schrader valve on here and they're almost infinitely adjustable. You're talking up to like 2% sort of difference all the way through. Um, obviously up to a maximum limit, depending on the shock and how it's tuned and the bike it's designed for, it can be up to 350 PSI. So that's quite a big range of adjustment, but it's all built in. You don't need anything else once you've got an air shock, whereas with the core shock, you're going to need that. Now with the core springs themselves, there's various different options available to you. There's the stock springs, which are fairly heavy. You get the lighter weight springs. Uh, these particular ones come in orange, they look kind of cool. Uh, they're about half the weight, they're insane, but they're also about double the cost. You can also get titanium springs, you can get progressively wound springs, and as we've seen on the GMBN Tech Show recently, you can get these things called the Sprindex springs, which you can actually change the spring rate. Uh, that's something we'll get into in another video uh, once we actually get to try some of this stuff out on the trail, but they're the basic differences between the springs on the two options. Now, I probably should have mentioned the only adjustment you have to you with regards to the spring itself when it's on the bike is spring preload. That is by using these dials that hold the spring in place. Now, the preload does not change the spring rate. It doesn't make it a heavier weight spring. What the preload does, rather than change the weight of the spring, is simply just changes the amount of load it takes to make the spring start moving. Uh, so for example, if your bike was bobbing around a little bit, you could put a couple of turns of preload on and it's gonna basically help resist that. But it's not the same as changing your spring pressure in here, which is equivalent of changing the spring for a heavier or a lighter spring. Uh, again, there's far more adjustability instantly available to you with an air shot, which is why that's kind of key. Now there's a few other differences. Because your spring medium is on the outside with a coil shock, the damper unit is just on its own. It has no additional seals, doesn't have to have air seals in there. It only has the seals to cope with the oil. And of course you've got your shim stack on the inside there for rebound and compression. And the damper rod basically, or the shaft, basically travels through that oil. On an air shock, of course, there's a lot more going on. On the inside, in fact, let's look at this one. It's a bit more basic so you can understand this. On the inside, you've got your air chamber here and you've got your oil chamber. As I compress it, you can see the internal damper shaft there moving through what would be full of oil there. As a result though, they're a bit harder to compress with nothing in them because of the fact you need a positive air spring, a negative air spring, and of course you've got the oil. All of that inside a shock body, of course, means more seals. You've got seals here, you've got seals here, and you've got external seals here, as well as on the inside there. It's a lot to go on. Now you could arguably say that a coil shock 
could work for longer with less routine maintenance because of the fact that there's going to be less stiction or friction in the system. With an air shock, of course, you're going to have to look after those seals a bit more, make sure everything's clean and lubricated in order for it to work as well as it should do effectively. So at the beginning of the video, I said there are some performance benefits to be had from running a coil shock. What exactly are those? Okay, well, first up is that small bump sensitivity that everyone talks about with coil versus air. Now you've got to think that on an air shock, you have to overcome the force of the air spring in order for the shaft to start moving. Um, quite simply, the coil shock unit basically takes less effort to get that shaft moving. Um, so it's kind of famous for having that sort of small bump sensitivity that you're going to get by the combination of the lack of sort of friction it has to overcome here at the shaft and of course with the actual movement of that coil spring. Uh, and finally is the consistency of damping. So if for example we just remove the piggyback from this and compare this directly to this air shock, you think that there is technically more space here for the oil on the inside basically uh, than there is on the air and oil system. So this can heat up more rapidly than this version can. And of course, hotter oil can get thinner, it can become less consistent in its behavior when going through the shim stack system. Uh, essentially what that means for you is more consistent damping on those really long sort of alpine rowdy sort of descents. Of course, this isn't always the case because some of the more modern shocks like this huge X2 here, they're incredibly consistent. Okay, so what about some of the limitations of coil shocks? Um, well, simply put, they're heavier. First up, so if you put an X2 on the scales here, uh, you're talking uh, 420 grams. Of course, this has cutaways, it's got no oil in it, we're well aware of that. If you take the coil version of the same shock here with no spring on it, it weighs 336 grams plus. You need to then add in the equation of the springs. So the standard spring, steel spring, that is a 516 grams, that is a whopping weight. Of course, you can have the lighter options available on there. So it's the super light steel springs, much lighter. So they're 274 grams. So that's quite insane, actually. Uh, obviously, there's a price tag that goes with that. And the same with titanium springs. So you are limited on what you can do with those. Now, something very important to say with the, one of the limitations of a coil shock, as a stock shock, as you're buying it off the shelf, coil shocks are quite linear by action, whereas an air shock, of course, is quite progressive by action. And a simple reason for that is you're compressing air in a compressed space. And what does that mean? It's going to get firmer the further into the travel you get, i.e. it ramps up more. So you're going to get three kind of bike designs as far as suspension goes. You're going to get falling rate, you're going to get a linear rate, and you're going to get a rising rate. If you were to put a coil shock, for example, on a falling rate bike, the linear action of it means you're going to go through that travel quite easily and you're actually going to bottom out the bike quite a lot. It's going to feel quite wallowy. Ideally, you want a coil shock bike uh, to be a rising rate by design, whereas a linear rate bike in combination with an air shock, very different thing. And you can also tune the air spring very easily by adding volume spaces. So they change the size of the air chamber internally to get it to ramp up even more. You could say off the shelf, an air shock really is better because of those factors. Very easily tunable, it's stuff you can do at home. Now the spring rate is the next thing that's not ideal, I guess you could say, on a coil shock. The coil springs themselves come in different weights, and what I mean by weights is the fact that you buy them in different weights to suit your body weight. Now with the longer ones you see on downhill bikes, you can get them in 25 pound increments, whereas the ones you start to see on trail bikes uh, tends to be 50 pound increments, so you might not get the sag to be the complete optimum. Now the last thing to take into account, of course, is not all coil shocks have any kind of sort of low speed compression or a climb switch. Now, climb switch is something we've basically come to love on air shocks because of the fact that you can near enough lock out your rear suspension if you want to sort of wind up a fire road or even pedal it to work on some tarmac, whatever your fancy. You don't tend to get that on quite a lot of coil shocks. On the very more expensive ones you can, but even then you don't get it on all of them. It's a retrofittable thing, so that means having to get the shock customised to have that. Now, on a coil shock, arguably on a trail or enduro bike, you're going to want that feature even more than you would uh, than on an air shock. 
because it's so much more active. Uh, just think, pedaling a six inch travel bike that weighs 32 pounds uphill all day long and the thing's bobbing up and down, uh, basically just because it's such an active shock. Take that into account with different riding styles and of course the bike styles, if you've got a bike that's perhaps got loads of anti-squat, it might be okay because the bike is naturally gonna stand up. But if yours hasn't, you're gonna be pedaling the thing, it's gonna be like pedaling the rugby ball, not ideal. Okay, so we've already looked at some of the basic differences between air shocks and cool shocks, but what I wanna know, Tim, is can I actually put one on the bike first up? Short answer, yes. Majority of bikes out there, you'll be able to fit a call shock in, no problem at all. Because generally, dimensionally, they're very similar to the air shocks that would usually already be on the bike you're replacing it with. There are some limitations. Certain brands have very specific mounts at different ends of the shock. Yeah. Not always a coil version of those available. So it's worth checking out with your dealer or by giving the shock manufacturer a call first. Um, the, in terms of clearance, generally, no problems. However, we'd always encourage someone fitting a shock to a bike that's slightly different to what they already have on there to run the shock through the travel first before, with, normally with no coil spring on, just to check all the linkages uh, clear. There's no, nothing foul in, so you're not going to have a nasty surprise when you take it off the first jump. Of course, find, yeah. You snap something. So it's always good practice to do that when swapping a shock, and even even with air shocks, actually. So, and um, in terms of ride feel, how different is this going to feel? So, as far as I know, this is standard. So yeah. I might have like a, a small spacer, air volume yeah. spacer in there. So, how, how much sort of difference in feel do you think I might expect? With the coil shock, it depends first and foremost how the frame has been designed. Yeah. If it's been designed purely with an air shock in mind. There is a chance when you put the coil shock on that you don't have enough progression in the frame design to give you support deeper in the travel. So a trait of that would be that the bike's feeling like it's riding too low in the travel. Dead would be a description some people might use. Yeah. You lose that kind of springiness and poppiness um, if there's not enough progression. If, however, the frame has been designed with a coil shock potentially in mind, then you will, you will still have an element of that there, hopefully a good part of that there, and the feel theoretically with a coil shock is it will be suppler at the early part of the trial because you haven't got the air seals to overcome when you're going into the into the trial. So that's where I might feel a bit more grip maybe on the Potentially, yeah, a bit more grip and traction on that on that sort of early part of the travel. Okay, so and then the final question. Now I have done this years back, but honestly I've been on air shocks for so long I've kind yeah. of forgotten. Setting up your sag on a on an air shock is easy. You yeah. pretty much get your shock pump and you yeah. dial in what you want. What is the calculation or how do I find out what sort of spring rate I need with the coil shock? Because that's a whole different realm trying to figure sure out. yeah well, there's a number of spring rate calculators available readily available online now um each of the shock manufacturers would have when a lot of the bike brands provide them as well if their bikes come with a, a version with a coil shock so i guess it's going to be different to each bike design kind of as well uh, yes yeah, so exactly because the leverage ratios are on different designs so it's all dependent on the stroke of the shock and then the rider weight um put all those, those numbers into the calculators and they'll get you in the ballpark of what spring to start with yep. Um, that's, a rec that's, a, that's a guideline, so what we do normally do then is fit the shock and the bike and the, the spring to the shock on the bike, get the rider on, measure the sag. You can fine-tune that particular spring with, by altering the preload, but you are limited on how much you can do that. So then in, in sort of the range of adjusting a particular spring rate, so what you would need to do then essentially is go up a spring rate or down a spring rate to tailor it until you get the right amount of sag. Sure. Um, so it, it can be a little bit more challenging to achieve that than an air shock where obviously you just screw a pump on and, and alter it onto the air pressure. Yeah, much. absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, well, in that case, then let's, let's get one on the bike and let's, let's see sure, if this yeah. works. I'm dead keen to, to have a little try. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so we fitted the shock to the bike and calculated the spring in advance. Yep. So assuming the, your weight, you're being honest about your weight. Yeah. <laughs> um, didn't eat too much over Christmas and all that. Then we should be should be in the ballpark. So we'll, we'll give it a go, get you on the bike, measure the sag and uh, take it from there. So what we recommend doing is sometimes, well, most of the time easier to have someone helping you with this. Measure the eye to eye of the shock 
before you sit on the bike and then measure it again once you sat on the bike. Yep. The difference is the amount of sag you have. So it's a of little course. bit more complicated than the near shock where you can do it all on bit your own. Bit of a calculation, but yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so this shock is 210 millimeter eye to eye. Fox recommend 30% sag, so that would be 15 millimeters on this particular size and stroke of shock. Okay. So what we're looking for is 210, so we're looking at a measurement, eye to eye measurement of 195 once you sat on the bike. Okay. So, yeah, bang on 195. So that shows us 15 mil of sag, which is what we were aiming for. So I'm gonna go for about seven clicks out, seven to eight on so each. So you one. have a kind of a, a rough gauge you'd start Yeah, out. if you check the owner's manual for Fox products, the, there's, a, there's a table that'll give you the shock eye to eye stroke, the spring rate, which is obviously determined by the rider weight and then it'll give you a recommended starting point. Yep. They are just suggestions. You, obviously, riders have different preference to what sort of feel they're looking for, um, but it gets you in the ballpark, and then you can deviate from that. Feels as good Feels as good. Any, any place to start, yeah. Yep, excellent. Well, hopefully that clears up a few things about coil shocks and air shocks and the sort of compatibility things you need to factor in on your bikes. Uh, I'm actually going to do some back-to-back -back testing. I've got this one set up with the bearing mount on here. Going to ride it back-to-back -back against that coil and see how things feel, see what my feelings are. We're going to make another video on that. But actually, to make it a bit fairer, because it's obviously got an air fork on the front, I'm actually going to be fitting one of these. So this is a Marzocchi Z1 fork, and it's actually coil sprung. So we're going to run the coil front and rear versus the air front and rear. Uh, look out for our video coming soon on GMBN Tech. Uh, thanks for hanging around. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so. Cheers, guys.